Welcome to the Restoration Domination Podcast, where you learn actionable advice that moves the needle and helps service-based businesses dominate. Here's your host, Rico Garcia Jr. What is going on, Dominators? Rico Garcia here with another amazing episode guys thank you so much for jumping on the show today do me a quick favor before we get started to let everybody know if you are ready to help us dominate fuck yeah <laughs> i love it i love it i love it i do me a favor um fill in some of the gaps on my intro for those that may not be familiar with the names may not be familiar with the company uh tell everybody exactly who you are and what it is that you are doing for the industry my name's Heather Schachter, and I'm the CFO for United Survivors Disaster Relief, otherwise known as USDR. And we're a 501c3 nonprofit that was formulated by survivors, and we aid and assist uh, people and animals in disaster zones. Awesome. Doug, you going to chime in on that? What Heather said. My name is Doug <laughs> Cool. I'm the CEO of USDR. Uh, you know, look, we, we started in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. Uh, when our community got wiped out, people came from all over the country. People sent things from all over the country to help us. We were surprised. We didn't really think anybody from, you know, liked anybody from New Jersey, but uh, it was very humbling. Uh, and a couple of years later, we started this as an organization. It's a all volunteer nonprofit. There is, you know, no paychecks. It's basically uh, just a way for us to pay forward the generosity that was shown to us by the rest of the country. So, so what, if we can ease a little bit of the pain and suffering in the world, that's what we try to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you, what was like the, 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 I mean, obviously, you know, big catastrophe and sometimes, you know, it touches really close to home, you know, it definitely pulls at the heartstrings and, you know, you want to do things to, to help the community. Most people in the restoration arena typically look at these disasters, look at this catastrophe and they're like, Hey, this is a huge profit center, right? You guys kind of decided to do the opposite and go the nonprofit route. So let's get into a little bit more of the, not only the, the, the mental play there, but also the emotional play. Why go the nonprofit route? You know, because it's not, you know, we're not looking to make money. Nobody, nobody came to our home and asked us for money when they helped. Mm -hmm. uh, and we desperately needed the help. And just to know that there were people around the country that were there for us, that were supporting us and showing us some love meant everything. Because being in a disaster is very isolating. Uh, you know, you, you suffer in a silo, even though your neighbors on all sides were also wiped out. You know, it's 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 very humbling and very isolating. So, you know, we're not it, it, in reality, you know, where everyone goes through a disaster and this is a great profit for them. You know, we're actually losing money. We we put some of our personal funds into this and a lot of time and energy. And, you know, we have day jobs. I'm the executive director of the American Policyholder Association. Heather is the CEO of uh, Creative Branding Solutions. She's also getting up and running with um, bookkeeping for her clients. So, you know, we have a very, very active, on top of raising a family, a very active business life, but we take our free time and, and we use it to give back and pay forward the kindness that was sent to us. Uh, we get a lot out of volunteering. We meet a lot of different people that we normally wouldn't who share the same values as we do. And it's nice to just be able to go in there and maybe just give them a hug because that's all they need and let them know it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is the what is the typical, you know, day to day, you know, in, in a catastrophe style setting look for your organization? And how do you guys, you know, get out to the people that actually need the help? So we collect donations back home. We do fundraisers um, for that specific disaster. Then we'll load up our van with supplies and we'll drive down. And a lot of times we stop at like a fire department. We don't like to go to places that are in the news and getting a lot of media. We like to go mm -hmm. to the areas that have no coverage or they're economically deprived, you know, getting no press, like I said, and uh, distribute them house to house. Nice, and it's nice. and it's generally chaos. I mean, you know, we're both planners. We both want to know where we're going, who we're going to meet, how we're interacting, who we're giving our supplies up to. And we gave that up very early uh, after our first disaster. There's no way you just have to drive into the middle of the chaos and mm -hmm. figure it out. And usually it takes us about half a day or the first day and then we hit our stride. You know, the people that we run into are the people that we're meant to help. 
I would say it's serendipitous how we find people. It is quite serendipitous. Really? So, so kind of expand on that. Do you have any like, you know, uh, moments or stories that kind of stand out and we're like, wow, I was really at the right place at the right time? I think um, during our first deployment in Hurricane Harvey, I'm going to have Doug tell the story, but that's why I brought up serendipitous because we ended up finding an animal in that disaster. And, uh, you know, we had brought, you know, it was our second deployment to Hurricane Harvey, which was our actual first time going to a disaster, you know, after we were wiped out. And our second time down, we brought a bunch of school books that school children in New Jersey had packed school backpacks for a really poor school district in Orange, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And it was heartbreaking. I mean, it was just they brought out four kids to, you know, five and six years old to take the backpacks or to ceremoniously accept them. And they were all foster children. Three out of four were foster children. It was just a very, you know, sad situation. But we were able to, you know, give them some resources. And then leaving there, you know, we had been up, dry, it's 27 hours to Houston from here. Right. Um, and maybe 26 to Orange. So we're sleep deprived and we're cranky and we get into a little tiff. Heather and I are both alphas. So our conflict resolution is basically a, a knife fight. So we're yeah. driving, arguing over something dumb and I'm not making, you know, I'm driving, I'm not making, I'm following directions. I'm just randomly making lefts and rights while we bicker right. and we're in a part of town we have no business being in and heather's got adhd so mm. you know look a shiny squirrel so right. i'm in the middle you know she's in the middle of yelling at me like you no good hey look there's a dog on the side of the road <laughs> and i'm focused i you know let's stay clear on the argument and i'm like there's you know it's texas there's dead dogs everywhere right um right. the dog's dead i saw it dead she's like it's not dead it's not dead Dog's dead, not dead. She made me turn around after about a mile and we went back and I'm like pulling up. And this poor animal uh, literally was on her last day. The vet had told us she laid down where she was to die that day. She had um, a double eye infection, double ear infection, head trauma, uh, puppy mange. Yeah, she was in bad, bad shape. Uh, poor little, you know, part golden retriever, part pit, the typical Southern mix, you know, what we, we call... Carolina dingoes sometimes. Um, but she just, as we pulled up, she just lifted her head a little bit. So we're in the middle of a disaster zone. Like I called mm -hmm. a couple of rescues and are like, you know, we had eight feet of water. We lost all of our animals. There's no right. vets open. There's nothing. So all we could do was take a picture of this poor little girl, sit down on the side of the road and post it. Like, this is what's happening. Right. And right. our friends from all over the country rallied and were able to find medical care that was close by that we could get her some medical care to keep her alive. People donated for her medical care, uh, and we were able to bring her back home to New Jersey. Well, you didn't share the part of how we named her. So we had been on the road all these hours. So we were like, we got to give her a name. So we're thinking all kinds of food, like butter, pancakes, something ridiculous. And then all of a sudden serendipity because, came up. So yeah, we called mm -hmm. her Dip. Nice. Yeah, because we were starving. So <laughs> it's like waffles, <laughs> butter, pan, you know. And, uh, so we called her serendipity and her name right. is Dippy. We were able to save her life thanks to the generosity of, you know, all of our friends and thanks to the miracle of social media. And uh, we brought her up, she had extensive medical treatment. And then what we did was we rehomed her with mm -hmm. a Superstorm Sandy survivor, a friend of ours uh, named Kelly, who her and her three kids were wiped out. It took them years to get home. They had just gotten home the year before and they were ready to have a family pet. So we were able to, you know, sort of rehome this disaster survivor with a disaster surviving family. And she lives half an hour away from us and she is living her dream. She is big, fat and happy, uh, living an amazing life. And if you could see on our shirt, like our motto is survivors helping survivors. And yeah. that's just what we did and what we do. That's awesome. So just to kind of get an idea, let's say that there is a catastrophe event, like typically how long does it take for you guys to mobilize and to start, you know, acquiring donations for that particular area in need? I would say we don't like to go in right away and mm -hmm. uh, get in the way of emergency services. So we typically deploy like a week and a half, two weeks 
after the disaster and we'll start immediately putting posts out and letting our friends know, hey, um, we're gonna be heading to this disaster and these are the items that we need. We know what items we need when we go in about the second week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now and now that we've been doing this for a while, uh, I, this is our sixth year, I guess. Um, we've been to- 15 disasters. 15 you know, deployments to natural disasters of every kind. Uh, smoke, fire, water, tornadoes, tornadoes floods, hurricanes, derecho. Um, mm. So we know what people need. But basically, we try to stay out of the way in the beginning. When they're still doing rescue and evacuation and uh, the initial cleanup of the main roads, you know, the one thing we want to encourage people, unless you are a rescue professional, uh, which we are not professionally trained, stay away. All you can do is get in the way, become a victim yourself, get in trouble. You know, cat zones are very dangerous areas, so it's not a good idea to go in the first week or two. So we hold back, and then when we get in, um, you know, we know we're not getting in anyone's way. And we'll deliver supplies, and maybe we'll run across the family or a couple that need um clean up or their house gutted, or maybe they found an animal or we find animals down there. Uh, or maybe they're completely displaced and haven't gotten a place yet. We'll assist in finding them a home. Yeah. And, and, and it's also, you know, we specifically look for the places, other volunteer groups, and there are some amazing volunteer groups out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Team Rubicon, which is all veterans Samaritan's and first responders, Purse. Samaritan's Purse. I mean, we see some really incredible people, third wave volunteers, mm -hmm. uh, really, really brilliant people. Um, but we, we're a small time operation, but what we look for is the the poor areas. You know, what we right, will right. sometimes say to local is where would you go and be afraid to be shot? Right. Um, because we know that's where other people are. Yeah, aren't nobody's going. going there. So we, right. we look for the economically under resourced areas. As Heather said, we stay away from the places that have been in the news because they're getting tractor trailers full of stuff. Yeah, they end up having warehouses full of supplies that aren't being distributed to the people who actually need it. The people who are getting hit with maybe storm surges, you know? Right. So that's, you know, a lot of it we see is there's a problem with how supplies hit the disaster zone, overloading in some areas, some areas get nothing. And even in areas where, you know, uh, what we saw in Mayfield, Kentucky, after the tornadoes mm -hmm. uh, a little bit over a year ago was, or almost two years ago now, you know, Everybody went to Mayfield with all these, you know, tractor trailers full of supplies are going into a warehouse. But because it's a poor area, people don't have cars right. or their cars were damaged in the tornado. So even people a mile or two away had nothing because you can't mm -hmm. walk two miles and carry back a load of supplies. Right. Um, right. So, you know, there's there's a lot of inequitable distribution of supplies. So we look for the places that aren't getting the love and that's that's the niche that and we fill. Some people, like things we do, um, sometimes maybe someone needs a door screwed back on and they don't have the ability to do it or they could use a fridge. So we'll try and get a secondhand fridge or mm -hmm. just do little things. Yeah, yeah, we'll bring little, you know, $250 gift cards down for, and it's interesting because people break down in tears when you you know you see people trying to be stoic, and when they get sometimes the smallest little thing, you know you'll see them break down. And, and as Heather said, sometimes the most important thing we bring down is the experience. You know we've been there, we've lived through this, we've survived it. Uh, mm -hmm. It took us seven years to get home when we lost our home. Um, so just and a hug, you know, just a hug and letting people know it's going to be okay sometimes everything and a lot of times we'll go into these uh cat zones and people tell us we'll be trying to give them donations because we know they're in need but they'll tell us oh no 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 we're fine we're fine and they're really not so we end up sitting and talking with them and then telling them our story about we too went through that and then we see that they'll take the donations you know it's almost like their pride gets in the way and there are some areas it's Sad to say, there are some areas they don't like outsiders, you know, like right, we found right. in the Appalachian Mountains that they had that really bad flooding last year. They don't trust people who aren't from that area. And sometimes it's challenging to give free stuff away to people uh, or free food. They, it takes people them a little while. You know, pardon me? They're jaded sometimes. Like they just, just simply just do not trust anybody that's coming in. Yeah. And I, they're not hostile. 
that are reserved. I mean, and, and right. we've, we've been in gang areas and been given supplies to, to gang members and, mm-hmm. you know, they're reserved, they're standoffish. Uh, right. Same thing right. in, in some of the areas in the mountains, they're reserved. They, they know you're not there. You're not from that area. And they're a little standoffish. We kind of lure them over to our van with, you know, <laughs> That doesn't sound good. (laughs) We lure them over to our van. With a puppy. (laughs) Anyway. But but we know what you need. If you were wiped out by a flood, I know you need towels, you need hand towels, you need wet wipes, you you need bleach, you need mold remediator. So, you know, we'll list a couple things and they'll come, they'll be like, oh, we'll take some wet wipes. And then when we get them over there, we just unload a whole bunch of stuff because I know what you need. And so many people... uh, they end up wanting to give us stuff. We've gotten eggs, <laughs> fresh eggs. From- <laughs> We've gotten fossils. We've gotten to play with a silky chicken. They just want to give back when you give to them because they're proud and they want to. They have that, you know. Thank you for your generosity. We want to give something back, and we're not there to take from the community, but certainly, you know, it makes them feel good. It makes them feel better about the whole situation. So let me ask you this: How, as far as the donations, because you know, as far as you know, getting people to help out right and um provide supplies and you know water and towels and all of this stuff there's an expense there um and typically in in catastrophe situations there's tons of restoration companies there's tons of public adjusters there's all of these pros that are making a really really good living at doing what they do um but a lot of them have their nose to the grindstone right they're so focused on just getting those projects done so that they can move on to the next project and yes they are helping of course because they are putting together you know these people's lives again i'm not taking anything away from that but you know do you find that pros in the industry are more likely or less likely to help and contribute financially um to causes like this or is it more the independent uh, individual out there who, you know, their hearts go out to those people in need? Um, I would have to say that there are a lot of businesses and companies that we know that do give back. Mm-hmm. You know, they see what's going on firsthand in, in the cat zones. And we do receive nice contributions from a lot of people we know. And we've also worked with other people they've come in with us other companies and brought their children with them so you see business owners and their kids and family going into these disaster zones doing volunteer work doing cleanup i guess it's Mm -hmm. all their values it depends yeah we i mean we started before we knew anybody in the industry Mm -hmm. um we we would just collect from our regular average middle class friends uh, we would put a post on Facebook and we get donations, $25, $50, or people would drop over off some cans of gas, et cetera. Um, and now as we're more involved with the industry, and I will say this, uh, nose to the grindstone is right. Uh, these victims that we deal with will never get back home if it is not for people from your audience, the restoration professionals, mm-hmm. the attorneys, the public adjusters, you know, the people that do the water and the, the mold remediation these and do the rebuilding. These people will never get back home. So that is important. But we also know so many of the people in the industry are church oriented. They're very generous. They're mm-hmm. very giving oriented. It's just hard for you to do when you're in the middle of a disaster zone. People go right. into these really dangerous chaotic disaster zones there's no place to sleep there's no electricity there's no gas 15 guys are crammed into a trailer together under difficult circumstances so sometimes and we're we're very bad at fundraising we are terrible at asking people for money it's just not no you don't have to donate yeah it's fine yeah so people that you know we get our donations because despite of ourselves so Mm -hmm. you know we do think the people in the industry because they do understand you know, they're, they want to help, but you can't because your role is to help these people get cleaned up, remediated, rebuilt, and home. And nothing should deviate you from that because it is so important. And they do help us do fundraisers and stuff like that, which is fantastic. And they're also experienced vicarious trauma, which is an, another thing by being in the cat zones themselves. Yeah, there's a there's a big problem with disaster trauma. It's this dirty secret that nobody talks about. Uh, and it is a huge barrier for victims or survivors to be able to get back home. There's a, something like 50% of the children are, will experience PTSD in the 
sub- subsequent 18 to 22 months. And it's, it's bad. And we also know the professionals. You can't go into a disaster zone and have trauma all around you without some of it getting on you. Uh, yeah. And yeah. that's, you know, as Heather says, that's called vicarious trauma. We mm-hmm. work with a wonderful organization called the Institute for Disaster Mental Health. Uh, we've done training where they have done what's called psychological first aid for people that come in and are dealing with a lot of trauma victims. And it mm-hmm. teaches you how to handle them, what's the best way to communicate with them, you know, what things not to say, which is very important. Uh, and we're always open if people are interested. We're, we, we sponsor that. Mm-hmm. We'll pay their freight for their, their executive director will come down and teach the course. It's a three She's hour, fantastic. Yeah, three hour course. And uh, it's, it's wonderful, but you know, yeah, I definitely think that that's a topic that needs to be discussed a lot more in the industry. I mean, I think that anybody who's had a team uh, at these disaster zones um, for any extended period of time has experienced somebody on their team having some kind of a breakdown. Um, I mean, I've heard stories of like, like guys literally just losing it after several weeks and like, you know, just doing crazy things like jumping out a window. It's like what, you know, it just, it gets to them. Right. And it's like, so, um, and there's a lot of talk about how the residences and the business owners uh, locally, the kind of services that they get and the support that they get, but, you know, kind of some, some of these unsung heroes, right. The restoration pros and some of the people that are there, first responders, you know, they do have a lot of psychological, um, trauma that can come with, with dealing with this day in and day out. I mean, you're being bombarded sometimes, you know, 12, 14, 16 hours a day with nothing but negativity and, you know, uh, it's just fighting this uphill battle, trying to get supplies, trying to get everything in order, living under the exact same rough conditions as the people that just lost everything. It's mm-hmm. just you have a little bit more of a stockpile in your truck of water and you know, maybe a fresh change of clothes, but that's pretty much it. So, I mean, do you feel that more companies should be looking at um, the mental aspect of you know what their crews are experiencing? I mean, what's your take on that? Absolutely. Um even ourselves, we uh, deploy into disaster zones and we find out certain things that are triggers, like he can't gut houses because he's traumatized from when he had to gut his home after mm-hmm. Hurricane Sandy. So there's, I think it's very beneficial. Yeah, and absolutely people should be doing some form of inoculation, you know, inoculation for their, their people because, look, everyone wants to be a tough guy. Uh, but that doesn't work because it just comes out sideways. Maybe you go home and you take it out on your family. Maybe years later, you know, it comes out. There's no getting through this without some form of vicarious trauma because you're jumping into the middle of people's worst nightmare. And you're in an environment that is a number one, a very dangerous environment. A lot of people get hurt and killed after the cat's already over. After the tornado, the flood, the hurricane's gone. These are very dangerous areas. And then on top of that, you're dealing with people, a population that is in trauma, they're in crisis. So some degree of preparation for your people to understand that because it's not for everyone. You know, one of the missions that we do and sort of the other side of the coin is we will bring trauma victims with us because we found in our experience, it's actually very therapeutic to be able to go into a cat zone and heal and help other people while they're in their worst moments. So we'll bring past disaster victims, 9-11 survivors, we'll bring, you know, first responders, veterans down with us. And, you know, number one, they are the best people to engage in that type of chaos because not, it's not for everybody. When everything's upside down, all the buildings are done. There's the streets aren't clear. It's very disorienting. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of these people do perform well. And we also find that it is very healing for them to, and it's triggering to a degree, but it's healing for them to go into someone else's trauma and be the person that helps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that, that's interesting. Um, what is? Let's get back to how people can get more involved and be supportive of what you guys are trying to accomplish in these disaster zones. Um, what do you guys do as far as getting that message out there? Because there's, again, there, there's a few volunteer services. I should say several volunteer services, and you know that do great work as you discussed before. Uh, but it really all just comes down to connections and funding. 
right? So what can our industry do more of and how can, you know, not only pros, but entrepreneurs in the space, but also individuals, individual homeowners, business owners, what could they do to support the cause? And how does that typically look? Well, I would like to see more business owners um, getting involved with uh, service work. Um, it boosts morale in your company mm. and it, it brings everybody together. Right? Yeah, in, a, in a, what they call blue sky activities, like, like in between the disaster zones. Uh, mm. When the disaster is happening, do what you do because it is so important. They, you know, studies have shown the longer people are displaced from their home and from their daily routine, the worse their trauma is and the worse mm -hmm. the experience. So when the, when the cat is happening, go there and do what you do. Don't allow anything to divert you. But in terms of blue sky stuff, you know, what you can do with your team, like a lot of, a lot of companies will do a volunteer day or they'll do a fundraiser. And it gives, number one, it's great for bonding. Number two, it's also really good for morale for your company. Build strong company culture. Yeah. And and because, again, a lot of people do give back in many ways. We see some mm -hmm. incredibly generous people that they give through their churches and et cetera. But, you know, this is a way that you can do through your company. And also keep in mind when we start getting toward the end of the year and your your tax liability is getting a little high, it never hurts to give money to a 501c3 organization it doesn't have to be us there's a lot of good ones out there but mm -hmm. you know it comes right off your bottom line for your taxes it is a it's a donation that becomes tax deductible and I certainly feel that you know again as long as you're confident with the organization you're dealing with the money will do much better in our hands to help the community than in the IRS's hands right. so yeah. by all means let's let's you know give to an organization that you have confidence with that you're comfortable with cash donations especially when you're in the middle of the disaster, you know, focus on that, throw a couple of bucks at one of these organizations. And there are other people that they don't even add, like Cal Spoon, uh, public adjuster boot camp. It Kevin shows up. K. Kevin K. They Combat show up with, chef, yeah. yeah, they show up with smokers and they feed people hot meals, like thousands of people. And mm -hmm. you can't underestimate the value of a hot meal when you are wiped out mm -hmm. in a disaster. And and they'll serve the the first responders too. They'll serve mm -hmm. the people in the industry the as well. Yep. Yeah, they'll serve the people that are showing up doing you know cleanup and restoration and rebuilding. You know, there's some really wonderful people out there. But find who you like, who you're comfortable with. Doesn't yeah, have to be so, okay. Okay, so let me let me be a contrarian here because I think it would be against my nature if I didn't if I just like swallowed that. Look, if I go out there with the smoker and I'm a restoration company, I'm not working. I'm not being charitable. Let's get that out of the way. Like I'm networking, I'm trying, that's a lead magnet for me because I'm a business owner. That's me as a business owner who is a for-profit. If I go out and I go take bottles of water, it's my logo somewhere in the back. And they're like, oh, cool. What do you do? I'm like, hey, I do restoration. Are you insured? Let me go ahead and help you out. So there's all of that, right? Also, if other pros come to me and the public adjuster's out there and he's like drenched in sweat, I'm like, hey, buddy, don't worry. Like, my name's Rico. I got this company. Boom, here's some water. I'm networking. I'm, I'm still, there's this underlying profitability thing that's there. Whereas with a 501c3, a, not, a truly nonprofit organization, that changes the, the, the way that, you know, it's perceived to the public, right? Mm -hmm. So- so break that down because you know I think that there's 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 different schools of thought as to what is apparently charitable and what comes from the a good place and then I, what has that underlying tone of hey this is a, this looks charitable but it's also just a profitable play hey dominators most owners with an agent marketer hope that they're getting a return on their investment but really have no idea how many referrals they're actually getting from individual agencies you see agent marketers are not sales professionals jerry edel is a specialist at referral revenue from insurance agents he started back in the 70s as a restoration technician and 30 four years later, ended up as the national sales trainer for one of the largest restoration franchise companies here in the U.S. And for the past 16 years, he's helped restorers succeed at creating long-term referral revenue from insurance agents. Agent marketers are in-person advertisers. Agent sales professionals are job generators when they actually have a strategy. Who do you have working for you? Do they have the tools that they need to capture the market share that's available to you? This is what I want you to do. I want you to talk to Jerry. Click the link to schedule a free call 
up-level your profitability today. Restoration contractors, listen up. Are you solely focusing on retail jobs because of the thought of dealing with insurance claims is just too daunting? Well, you could be letting a significant amount of business growth opportunities just slip through your fingers, but I don't want you to worry because this is where Inc. comes in. Inc. has actually developed a system that helps you navigate the complex world of insurance claims, turning them into as close to a cash or retail job as possible. And what this does is it helps you keep the cash flow steady so that way you don't have to dip into any of your reserves. So imagine being able to grow your business, keep your crews well compensated, pay for all of your materials and bills promptly, and more importantly, keep that vital cash flow moving. And here's the opportunity for you. I want you to visit Inc.com. That's I-I-N-K.com. And then I want you to use promo code DOMINATE. And this is going to give you a whopping 50% off of Inc. Pay's one-time sign-up fee of just $2.99. In addition to this, you're also going to have some access to the rest of Inc. Payments solution. So make sure that you head on over to Inc.com, that's I-I-N-K.com, and use promo code DOMINATE. So break that, break that down for me. So I would say the separation between the business and you as an individual going out. And for example, the Ware family, they go mm-hmm. to the disasters to make money. But then they Mm. separate from their advertising of their logo for their company and they go out with their children and go house to house Mm. and clean up. Or Mm. you separate and like Kevin K, combat chef, he doesn't have his company all over. That's his nonprofit that he's doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and P.S. We're not mentioned because there's a lot of bullshit in disasters. There's a lot of people that aren't there for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. If I'm naming an organization, it's because I've worked with them side by side in disasters and we have per and we're, we got real good bullshit meters. Uh, We've worked with them side by side and we know they're the real deal. Uh, I will tell you, Cal Spoon is not there. I'm sure, you know, he's having some conversations, but he's not there to network. There's smarter ways to do it than that. He's literally there to help. I just, you know, we, and you know, we see if you're hearing it from us, you know, I'm not going to endorse anyone or throw because, you know, look, if I say, hey, go give money to this person, you're not giving it to us. So I right, wouldn't say 100%. that unless, of course, I have complete confidence that they're there for the right reason. And again, many people are not. And they're coming out of their the own culture. pocket a lot of times we see. So we'll even yeah. make a donation if we see that they're... uh feeding a ton of people and running short on food we'll give them a donation or we'll go buy them food to feed more people we saw with cal spoon he had several people there helping him that were specifically there to feed people yeah yeah i want to get back to culture because you mentioned culture and i think that that's it's 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 worth discussing uh the effect the psychological effect that a small little shift in what you do and how you do it how that actually affects the company culture uh, and the bond of the people that are in these disaster zones, right? So for a lot of restoration companies, again, they're probably one of the first ones on site. They're gutting homes. They're feeding people in some cases or giving them towels or trying to relocate them. There's tons of different ways that they can help. And they're being paid for that, right? Like, you know, the guy, the boots on the ground, they're being paid for that. And they know that they're helping, but they also know that they're being paid. The volunteering aspect, though, and the way that a company can come together and say, hey, by the way, this is what we're going to do you know, on this day, or this is what we're going to do in this evening, and this is coming from the heart. This is something that, you know, somebody can raise their hand and say, hey, look, you know, we're going to go door knocking and make sure that everybody, you know, in this area is taken care of. How much does that change? the psyche of that crew because again they're doing a lot of the same things but the difference is is pretty much in the tone and maybe in the outlook on how they're looking at that how do you think that that changes company culture and the bond and everything else well i look i was a financial advisor for 30 years and uh my firm was with the fortune 500 company and we did a lot of you know volunteer days habitat for humanity and etc but that's not why i'm getting into that it's more about if you're there just for money, if you're there cha-ching with dollar bills in your eyes, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's very different when you accept, you know, what we do is important and we are here to help people. We are not just here to, you know, funnel money into the system and make more money and get rich. You know, you will see the difference. 
but it is way more fulfilling. People have more job fulfillment. They have more job satisfaction when they know they're helping people. And yeah, the compensation is important. But when and they'll actually have more satisfaction with their company, they'll have more faith and trust in their owners. If I look at my owner and say, this guy or girl is just about making money, all they care about is the bottom line, there's going to be a trust issue there. Because maybe one day they're going to throw me under the bus to save a nickel. But when I say, here's someone who's about giving back to the community, someone who's got a heart, someone who's compassionate and is there to help people when they're down, there's more what we used to call in the military unit cohesion. Uh, You know, like I might have somebody at work. I don't get and I've had this experience, you know, back in my my financial advisor days, somebody I didn't get along with, but we each had the value of helping somebody. So when I'm in, you know, a really tough area of Newark, New Jersey, and, and we're both swinging a hammer because we are, we want to help people. It is a way for us to sort of bridge that gap. Do you have a, uh, an additional take on that, Heather? No, he's like, everything was well, covered I, in that one Because <laughs> I was thinking about so many other things from our conversation while mm-hmm. he was talking. There are a lot of companies out there, like Larry Bond, he was donating like roof wraps to a ton of people. And a lot of people don't know that he does that. And he does it mm-hmm. out of his own pocket, you know? Right. So people may be out there to do some advertising and get some business, but he, he's another selfless person. We, we get to see, there, look, there's a certain percentage of population that's like, hey, if you feed a homeless person, you don't tell anyone because right. they lose it. We're sort of the opposite. And look, if that's all you did was you handed a, sa- a sandwich to a homeless person this week, all right, don't tell anyone. But if you're doing this and you want it to be sustainable, right. you want to be able to inspire others. Mm-hmm. We're like, dude, stand on the mountaintop and wave that flag. We're over mm-hmm. here helping people. If you want to be part of what we do, come join us because there are a lot of people that want to help. They just don't know how. Sometimes mm-hmm. they just need someone to inspire them, someone yeah. to show them where to join and how to do it. And somebody who just says, you know, this is what we're doing. If you want to be a part, come join us. So we're pretty loud about what we do. We post everything we do. And, uh, but we see the people like Larry, you know, they picks- do it secretly and they don't tell anybody. But yep. sorry, we're, we're going to out you if you do a good deed. Like Heath Hicks, he is a pure example of what companies should be doing, what business owners should be doing. You want to share with him a little bit about what Heath does? He he does a lot. I would love for you to have Heath on sometime mm-hmm. and share about because he's very quiet and very uh, chill about it. But um, you it's know, usually the quiet ones that are always working in the shadows that are doing the most and, you know. So can can you share a little bit about what what they do so that way our, our audience can get, get maybe perhaps get some ideas as well? Well, a common thing that we'll see is the people that do it quietly. You know, you got to kind of watch people and we're we're big observers of people, especially when you go into a disaster zone. So, you know, Heath will do a you know, he'll do a roof giveaway to, you know, his roofing company. They'll do a roof giveaway. They do something every December where they raise over a hundred thousand dollars to give away to people and help people out. You know, there's, again, I'd I'd love to see you have, you know, some of these people on uh, and talk about what they do. I don't want to give away their thunder too much. Those those people are share the same values as we do. And you tend to attract others. And, And that's the key. The key is, you know, we may not get along. We might be on the opposite side of the world on so many things. We might be competition, but if we have this one common value, where we help yeah. people in a time of need. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Uh, Steve Badger is one of the biggest defense attorneys for insurance companies. Uh, mm-hmm. And in our world of the APA, uh, American Policyholder Association, which you know facilitates the prosecution of insurance companies who commit fraud against consumers, and Steve, in his role as one of the top defense attorneys for insurance companies, we're kind of at odds. But, you know, we did a fundraiser some in Dallas and Steve showed up and was incredibly generous. You know, he gave away his mm-hmm. he, he allowed us to raffle off his um, Park City, Utah home. ski resort home uh, for nice. a week. And we raised like thirteen thousand dollars just bidding on that for a week. And mm-hmm. uh, and I talked to him. I was like, Steve, I, I really appreciate you showing up. And, you know, he was very clear. He's like, you know what, Doug, we all sort of make a living 
you know, during other people's misfortune. And this is the one thing we have in common. We can do something to give back and make sure that's the one thing that we all sort of share is those values where we can give back. It doesn't have to all be about take, take, take money, yeah. money, money. So that, you know, that's an example. And we see a lot of those where people that, you know, they're competition, they're at odds, but they have that same value, which is we find the people that are suffering uh, and we do something to alleviate that suffering. I love that. And and I think it's been proven true uh, time and time again that there are few things in the world that unite people more than a catastrophe or you know, a time of need, you know, not to, you know, bring up uh, really old things, but I mean, you look at uh, the the United States just, you know, as a nation back in 9-11, I mean, that was the biggest time of unification, I think that, you know, that we've had in recent history. And again, it was all surrounded by, uh, you know, some, a huge catastrophe, right? And I think that that's where, yes, you're going to have the, the really bad apples that are like you said, that they're just out to make money. And that's great, right? There's a time and place for, for all of that as well. But you also see a lot of people's, the, their better nature come to the surface. And maybe, you know, it's it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be a roof. Maybe sometimes it's just to be a, a shoulder for somebody to cry on. Yeah, mm. be be a hug, right? You know, save, save a, a, a stray, whatever the case may be. Sometimes it's these smallest, smallest little acts of kindness that, really make the most amount of not only emotional impact but psychological impact uh it could really get people through the these things that they're going through so let me ask you this if the people that are listening now they're, they're they want to get more involved they want to contribute you know maybe because you guys are going to a lot more disasters than possibly a lot of restoration companies go to right um but they still want to contribute they still want to be there they 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 you know, want to do their part, how do they go about, you know, aligning with your organization, donating to your organization and playing their part? We have our donation link on our website. Uh, that's unitedsurvivorsrelief.org. And they could click on there and put a donation. We also have a PayPal donation link as well. Awesome. You can reach out to us personally. And we usually put a call to action, uh, right after uh, a disaster happens, like if we need volunteers to come with us. And, and the other thing we're doing now is, you know, we're stockpiling supplies. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we have a couple of people around us that have donated some warehouse time, you know, space for us. So we're able to stockpile in advance. So when the time comes, we're trigger pull ready. So, you know, we do some fundraising even when there's not a disaster going on. So it, it makes it a little bit simpler, a little bit less stressful a little bit easier for us to be trigger pull ready to deploy. And again, there's, there's some great organizations out there. Just do something. It doesn't have to be us and USDR. Uh, there are some great, you know, we've named quite a few, you, you know, do something to give a little bit back. So it's not, here's what I'll say. And this is what Heather and I always talk about. America is a great country. You can get rich in our amazing capitalist society and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you can do it, honestly and ethically and have a little bit extra to give back to people that are not as fortunate as you that's success you know success yeah. is not just you know what kind of car you drive and you got a you know a plane or you know where you go on vacation it is yes the financial piece of it but it is also doing it in an honest ethical way not cutting corners and having a little bit to give back to people that aren't as fortunate. If you can do those three things, in my book, you're successful. And there are many ways to give back. Yeah, there's, um, like when we go into a disaster zone, we'll get people calling us, telling us, hey, we'll let you stay here if you need a place to sleep, you know? So mm -hmm. maybe you can offer your garage or something for somebody to, to sleep in or buy them a meal or something simple. Yeah, one, one right. of the things we do is we try to, not have an adverse impact on the disaster zone. So number one, we, we don't go down when we have no business being down there, at, you know, when during search and rescue, et cetera. And number two, we make sure that's why we drive our van. We bring our own place to sleep. We bring our own food. We bring our own water, our own electricity. So we're not drawing anything away from the survivors. But some areas, like I, I don't know if we can do too many more 27-hour drives to Texas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, so sometimes we will fly in, we'll source supplies <laughs> just outside of the disaster cone, and then we'll, yep. we'll rent the truck and bring them in. And then we don't have our comfy little van 
uh, that we can sleep in. So sometimes even just offering us, and we have a lot of people that help us. They offer us space to store our supplies where we can have people ship yeah. it. Like we have a friend that has a warehouse that we're storing stuff in in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. We've had people at their offices, their company offices, receiving packages for us or even putting them in their pickup trucks and transporting for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's lots of ways to help. Yeah. You know, look, look, if you, we're not saying you have to do what we do. Uh, what we want your audience to know is do what you do because it is so important. As I said, keep getting people back home. That is critical. Keep remediating the dangers in these areas for the, for the population. And then, you know, throw a little bit to somebody who is helping out, who can just focus, like you said, on the nonprofit world, which is a 100% pure mission of helping survivors. That's awesome. So thank you, Heather and uh, Doug, for jumping on today. But more importantly, thank you for everything that you're doing. I know that obviously it's a lot of time. It's a lot of energy. Uh, it, it takes uh, a toll, not only mentally, but emotionally to do what you guys are doing and, and just pooling all of these amazing people together that are helping in the disaster zone. For all those dominators out there, I think that this is a great call to arms. This is an opportunity for you, regardless of where you are in the nation, for, for you to really start thinking outside the box. What do you have, right? It's not a matter always of resources. It's a matter, matter of resourcefulness. So maybe you don't have the financial wherewithal or you don't want to help in the financial sense, but maybe you do have the warehouse. Maybe you do have that extra truck. Maybe oh. you uh, can go ahead and if you're already on 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 site or on route to a site, uh, you can go ahead and deliver supplies. There's so many different ways in which you can help. And if you're already going to have a presence in that area, then all the better team up with someone that's doing some great things in uh, the community and in the surrounding areas that are not as fortunate and we are going to have all of the links in the video description as well as in the show notes below make sure that you reach out do your part do whatever it is that you can to help those in need we all in the restoration arena we all love to make money we understand that but there is something beautiful about taking a pause from that money making activity and then actually just being present with the people that need it most with nothing to gain uh, other than the feel goods that come along with just being another human being helping a human being. So again, guys, thank you so much for uh, jumping on with us today. And as always, hustle, hack, dominate. I will catch you guys on the next one. You've been listening to Restoration Domination, your number one resource for tips, tricks, and hacks to help your business grow. Subscribe to our channel and follow us for more Restoration Domination. And follow our host at Rico Garcia Jr. on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Till next time, this is Restoration Domination. Hustle, hustle, hack, hack, dominate, dominate.